Thanks a lot. Um, so I'm going to talk about how moral uncertainty bears on climate change, climate ethics, um, and climate economics. So Martin Weizmann is, and other climate economists are well known for arguing that climate change brings a non-negligible probability of a catastrophic outcome, and therefore that strong and kind of urgent action on climate change is justified. And those who make some variant of these, uh, those who make this argument from tail risk make some variant of the following two claims. And the first is an empirical claim, which is that the probability of extreme global warming sufficient to destroy or otherwise undermine the long-run potential of human civilization is in the, ball, in the ballpark of around 1%, um, maybe higher. And there's also a moral claim, which is that destroying or otherwise undermining the long-run potential of human civilization would be extremely, perhaps infinitely bad. Um, and that the cost of destroying human civilization would sort of swamp many times over the cost associated with much lower levels of warming. So there's really two fat tails here. So the probability distribution across levels of warming has a fat tail, and the utility, utility as a function of warming also has a kind of fat tail, such that the disutility of warming increases very rapidly at the upper end of warming. Um, this argument, or well, these two claims, have been the subject of obviously a significant disagreement amongst climate ethicists and climate economists and climate scientists. But um, there's one argument which has received, one of Weizmann's arguments which has received less attention, which I'm going to talk about today, which is potentially more practically important because it places a kind of lower burden of proof on the empirical claim and the moral claim provided some. some some assumptions hold. So, Weissman says that, suppose for the sake of argument, a policymaker believes the probability is 50% that my fat tail specification is correct and 50% that the thin tail specification of someone else is correct. Other things being equal, rational policy should lean more in the direction of my fat tail conclusions because of the highly asymmetric consequences of fat tails versus thin tails. Um, in this sense, whether it's fair or unfair, the playing field isn't level between me and someone else. So, I take here that. Um, Weizmann's referring to the um, moral and empirical uncertainty about, um, about climate change, and his argument is basically about how it's rational to respond, given that we're uncertain in the empirical and moral claim. And I think the basic idea is that rational choice is kind of a function of what's at stake according to the different empirical and moral theories in which one has credence, and we ought to have some credence in the empirical and moral claims, and given that so much is at stake according to these claims, Strong action on climate change is, is kind of the rational thing to do. So, call this, I'm going to call this argument the metanormative climate change argument. Um, for, this, for this argument to get off the ground, you need to show not just that some people, some experts, believe that um, the empirical claim and the moral claim are true, you need to show that this should bear in some way on the beliefs or the probability function of rational policymakers. And you can do that by showing that people who endorse these claims are epistemic peers and then have some, or, or superiors, and have some account of how you should respond to that. Um, so it seems plausible that some people who endorse the empirical claim count as epistemic peers or superiors for rational, for, for policy makers, so Weizmann endorses it, if you read chapter 10 of the um, IPCC physical science report, there's lots of um, climate models that show this, this fat tail thing, and they, these also exclude other potentially important feedbacks. So it seems reasonable that some of these people obviously count as epistemic peers or epistemic superiors for, for policymakers. And then there are a number of theories which entail the moral claim. So again, Weizmann endorses it for his own specific reasons. But other theories also have these implications, such as um, total utilitarianism. And I'll discuss why that is uh, later on. But basically, any theory that's pretty, pretty strong has a, like, a, a strongly aggregative and temporally neutral um, utility function is, is probably going to accept something close to the, the moral claim. And it seems that some of these people should count as epistemic peers. Um, so the question then is how do you respond to the fact that um, there's peer disagreement about these things and it seems that you should divide your credence in some way across the empirical claim and the moral claim. And then the question is, given that you've done that, how should you act given that you have these credences? And to answer that we need to make use of well, just so I understand, I don't understand what you mean by epistemic peer. What, what are you saying in the slide? Can you say it in plain English? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, so basically, they're kind of as good at reasoning about, or they, 
They're uh, roughly equivalent to the common. Yeah, equivalent to the common, common with guess. respect to those domains. Right. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> um, so the, the question is, how should we how should we respond to these kinds of uncertainty? And there's, there's an ongoing philosophical disagreement about how we ought to respond to empirical uncertainty. So objectivists hold that what you ought to do um, depends solely on what the outcomes of your actions will be, whereas subjectivists hold that what you ought to do depends on the variably probable outcomes of one's actions, uh, which are given by your kind of subjective probabilities. So a subjective utilitarian, for example, is going to say we should maximise expected utility, which weights ut um, actual utility by, by the probability of the outcomes, whereas um, an objectivist is going to say that you should maximise maximize utility. And there's a parallel debate for how you should respond to moral uncertainty. So what I'm going to call metanormativist hold that um, an agent's uncertainty with respect to moral theories bears in some sense in what they ought to do. Um, and normativists deny this. So I take the metanormative ought to be a kind of rational ought rather than a moral ought, because I understand that's how, that's how Weizmann mean, means it, and I think that's potentially more plausible, but I'm not sure. Um, so, assuming that, assuming that we should respond to moral uncertainty, how should we go about it? Well, one of the most natural um, prime face I was to approach it is this my favourite theory approach, and it says that one should follow the, the view one thinks most likely to be true. But this kind of runs into some potential counter examples. So, if you consider this chicken or impossible burger case, and David's in a restaurant, he's deciding whether to order chicken or this plant-based impossible burger that the Americans have invented. And he's got 49% credence in an animal welfare view, which says that ordering the chicken is very badly wrong. And he's got 51% credence in an anthropocentric view, which says that you should just be indifferent between ordering the chicken and ordering the impossible burger. Um, so he's permitted to choose either. So on my favorite theory, which you follow, is anthrop on, which you follow the anthropocentric theory, and, sh and, just, and he's permitted to order the chicken. This seems kind of like a big risk to take, given his partial beliefs. Given that he has these subjective probabilities and these moral views, he's kind of taking a relatively big risk of doing something very badly wrong, even when there's no countervailing benefit from the point of view and the theory in which he's acting. Um, and this, the, the basic problem here is that my favourite theory is kind of insensitive to the stakes according to the theories in which one has credence. So one possible solution to this is this theory, which I'm following Brian Hedden, called maximise into theoretic into theoretic expectation. And this is analogous to expected utility theory in that it weights um, what, you, what you ought to do according to the uh, credence you have across, across moral theories. So it's sensitive to what's at stake in the theories in which one has credence. And basically, um, maximising into theoretic expectation, it sums up the, um, the expected moral value of an action according to the different theories in which you have credence, and then weights them according to the credence you have in those theories. So you can make a parallel kind of move to what you would do with expected utility theory. You suppose that your uh, doxastic or belief-like state can be represented with the probab probability function P, and that Ti denotes the moral theory I, and then each theory in which one has credence can be represented in expected moral value terms. And then this gives you the inter-theoretic inter expectation, and you can see here it's, 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 um, it's weighted by the, the credence you have in, in each theory, and it sums across all of these theories. <coughs> so it's highly controversial whether um, inter-theoretic comparisons across moral theories are possible. So it's controversial whether, it's very, very controversial whether all moral theories can be represented in expected utility terms. And it's also controversial whether amongst theories that can be represented in expected utility terms that into theoretic comparisons are possible. But I'm just going to assume that um, some into theoretic comparisons are possible for the purposes of this paper between some subset of moral theories and then I'll uh, discuss what follows in that case. So we can apply Mike to the chicken example. If we have that option A is ordering the chicken, option B is ordering the impossible burger, you can see the animal welfare theory is saying that ordering the uh, chicken is very bad, whereas yeah, potential theory doesn't really care. So you can then compute the inter-theoretic expectation. You see here this is the sort of main difference. Your, your credence 
in that multiplied by how, how bad that option would be. So the inter-theoretic expectation of B exceeds that of A, and so on might um, David ought to do B. And in this case, the animal welfare theory is David's effective moral theory, in that it's the theory that determines what he ought to, some, in some sense, to do. <laughs> and this is the sense in which the playing field isn't level in the way that Weissman was talking about. I mean, he's got lower credence in this animal welfare theory, but here it's, it's dictating what, what it is that he ought to do. So we consider how Mike would apply to climate change, and I'll just assume that um, rational policymakers should have some credence in the empirical claims such that they think there's a non negligible probability of a catastrophic outcome. <coughs> and we can apply Mike to kind of a stylized example of climate policy. So we've got, we've got two policies. High and low, and high is a $100 per tonne carbon price, and low is a $20 per tonne carbon price. And I think if you look at the, if you look at Weizmann's estimates of climate sensitivity and the probability of different emissions pathways, it seems sort of roughly plausible that the probability of existential catastrophe from unmitigated climate change, or from just the unconditional probability of um, climate change caused catastrophe, is around 3%. Uh, if we don't do anything about it. Um, so let's so suppose that high eliminates this risk and just it reduces the risk of existential catastrophe by three percent, and low low only reduces it by 0.5 percent, and neither introduces any other kind of catastrophic existential risks. So, as in the chicken example for the MCC to work, the choice between high and low has to have differential stakes from the point of view of the theories in which policymakers should have prudence. Um, so the question then is: Are there any theories that, that say this choice has differential stakes? And the answer is yes, namely those that put um, special weight on avoiding existential catastrophe. So Weizmann's theory has this, Weizmann endorses this, <coughs> or says it's plausible this, this utility function with constant relative risk aversion, which implies that at very low levels of consumption, the margin utility of consumption is extremely high, perhaps infinite. Um, and other theories have this implication as well. I think maybe the most plausible is total utilitarianism. Um, and I'll talk about that theory and what follows. So, total utilitarianism implies that you ought to maximise total utility, and the total utility of a population is the product of the average of its average utility and its size. So, this basically leads total utilitarianism to put very high weight on the far future because there's so many possible good lives in the far future um, that the far future has very high total utility, and therefore that. Increasing the probability that this future is realised is um, has extremely high expected value for that reason. <coughs> um, so we can apply this to the stylized case that I've developed, and Hilary Graves and Toby Orn order showed that with some qualifications on, which are potentially inessential, on might provided that one has non-zero credence in total utilitarianism. Total utilitarianism dominates the theoretic expectation calculation. So, <laughs> in the large population limit in which the size of the possible future population that would be deprived of existence by um, hu human civilization being destroyed, as the, as the size of this population tends to infinity, the total, the total view is going to um, say that the difference between the expected moral value of, of high and the expected moral value of low tends to positive infinity. Um, whereas on leading theories that don't put this kind of, kind of fanatical about the far future in the same way, and they therefore value low over high, the expected moral value, the difference between the expected moral value of low over low and high approaches a finite bound. bound. <coughs> and this, follow, this implies that this ratio approaches infinity, um, because you have something tending to infinity over something approaching a finite bound, which means that the ratio approaches a finite bound. And this means that total utilitarianism basically swamps the inter-theoretic expectation calculation, provided that we have non-zero credence. <coughs> so, <coughs> for this stylized case, um, the MCC is sound merely by the fact that you have some credence in the total view or some other view which puts extremely high weight on avoiding ex existential catastrophe. You kind of push to this um, quite strong climate change stance. So the question is, does this, does this argument work? And there's, you can, I think you can question the philosophical and the empirical assumptions. It's kind of unclear whether the argument is sound. 
Um, so the, the first category of criticisms I'll call first order criticisms, and these try to show that the empirical claim and the moral claim are unlikely to be true, and these have maybe comprised the lion's share of, of criticisms of Weizmann and others who've made this argument from Taylor's. But these arguments are, seem likely to kind of be ineffective against the metanormative climate change argument, because they have to show that policymakers should have zero credence in any theory that entails moral claims. They should have zero credence in total utilitarianism, zero credence in Weizmann's kind of uh, similarly fan fanatical utility function. Um, I mean, you might think they're very implausible, but having zero credence in something seems, seems kind of tough to show. Um, and they'd also have to show you should have very low credence in the improved claim that policymakers would just have to ignore all these climate scientists, these climate models that have, that have this, um, this fat tail feature. So this kind of seems like an implausible burden of proof for these first order criticisms. I think that's an input, important result. Um, another thing, my question is whether real world climate policy is, is, is like this Starwise case. In his discussions of um, climate risk, Weitzman mainly, mainly tries to show that the expected social costs of climate change are very high. He doesn't do a cost-benefit analysis of climate policy. And it's a step from showing that the, the expected social costs of climate change are very high to showing that you should do anything about it. I mean, if you can't do anything about it, even if it's got high expected social costs, then um, you should just not have a carbon price at all. It doesn't make any difference. Um, so you might question the empirical assumption is that climate policy doesn't introduce any existential risk. So for example, it seems like if you're going to take urgent and aggressive action against um, climate change, you probably have to make extensive use of nuclear power. It's the only low carbon source of baseload power generation, but maybe that increases the risk of nuclear proliferation, which increases the risk of nuclear war. So there's these, these kind of pressures you have to take account of. And Weizmann himself advocates research into solar geoengineering, which read the literature on it, there's some experts think that that itself introduces some catastrophic risks, either as a kind of stressor for political risks or as creating its own direct environmental risks. Uh, yeah, that might be questionable, but anyway, you get the, you get the broad idea. But, um, and the, the second point, maybe more important, which was made by Nordhaus and Pindick in their criticisms of Weizmann, was that you know, climate, climate change isn't the only existential risk going. There might be, there might be other ones, and we need to prioritise across all risks. If we accept this view that we put this very high premium on avoiding existential risk, then we need to prioritise across um, existential risk. And Weizmann does consider this, and he talks about how asteroids are low risk, and I agree with him about that. But I didn't find his. I mean, it's probably not intended to be comprehensive, but I don't think it's it's that it's that persuasive when you actually look at the evidence. So from my own kind of discussions with people at the Future of Humanity Institute, <coughs> there seems to be a consensus that artificial intelligence, nuclear war and biotechnology are more severe risks than climate change over the next hundred years. Certainly over the next hundred years. Um, so <coughs> and that's also my reading of the evidence having, having looked at that. So you'd want to you'd prioritise whatever re reduced existential risk by the greatest amount on the, on the foregoing argument. Um, it's obviously very hard to say how you should, how you should do that because there's so much uncertainty about these risks. Um, and then you might say, okay, assuming that metanormativism is true, are there any other problems with might? I think Matthew's going to talk about the thing I'm going to talk about now, which is how does might deal with infinities? So the most notable thing about Weizmann's dis dismal theorem is, as he says, the expected social cost of climate change are are <coughs> oh, infinite. The, the problem with that is if you use this maximise inter-theoretic expectation argument, it leaves you um, with this problem of paralysis, which is that you know, if you times any number by positive infinity, you get positive infinity. So reducing existential, you should be indifferent between reducing existential risk by any amount. You should be, in, in my stylized case, you should be indifferent between reducing, uh, you should be indifferent between high and low. Um, so it doesn't kind of get the result that I think Weizmann wants. This is basically another way of saying that might inherits the problems of infinite ethics that climate economists have probably talked about more than philosophers, I think, um, and uh, they're obviously difficult. Um, <coughs> and the final category of criticisms come from the normativist direction, so they say that moral uncertainty doesn't actually 
matter for what for for what um, policymakers ought in any sense to do. Uh, I suppose this was the dom dominant view in philosophy until relatively recently. Maybe it still is the dominant view. And the main criticism of normativism is that it's not sufficiently action guiding. So I'll try and sort of gently rebut this criticism in a very short period, period of time. Um, so you might think this is an access requirement on what you're rationally required to do, so such that if one is rationally required to X, then one can know or have sufficient evidence for the fact that one is rationally required to X. <coughs> so the first thing to say is that I think it's unclear whether access is a genuine, genuine requirement on uh, normativity and what ought to be done. So it may violate a normative implies can principle. You could have sufficient evidence for the fact that you ought to do A, even though you can't do A, and therefore you um, ought to do B or C. So I don't, this, this example needs to be spelled out, but this is kind of a common criticism of, of this principle. And the second thing is that assuming that access is a genuine um, requirement on normativity, it's unclear whether norm, uh, normativism fails to satisfy it, or, or whether it, whether most moral uncertainty sort of falls if, is, is the product of lack of access to the evidence. So it seems that most moral uncertainty is just driven by the fact that, that we're suboptimal reasoners. It's very hard to hold all the implications of one's moral theories in, in one's mind and consider all counterintuitive, uh, consider all the kind of implications and possible counterexamples. Um, it doesn't seem that we like evidence for the correct moral theory. And if we do, that doesn't seem to be driving the large portion of moral uncertainty. <coughs> Actually, that's this is a very big question in like, metaethics and moral epistemology, but. Um, it certainly seems that it's, it, it, it's chiefly driven by the fact that we're not, not it, that moral philosophy is hard. Um, not, not that we lack, not that we're lacking some evidence. So, in response to that, you could relativise normativity to our, our rational capacities and say that what it's rational to do, given that you're this suboptimal reasoner, the problem with that is that it kind of lets abhorrent or crazy views determine what, what, it's, what it's rational to do. So, you know, if you if you don't have the kind of rational wherewithal to um, refute a, a racist or a sexist theory, and then in what sense ought you to act, given that you have credence in these theories? I'm not sure there's any kind of I don't know. It seems counterintuitive that you ought in any area, any respect to act, given that you have the credence in those theories, even given your suboptimal reasoning capacities. And you know, moral philosophies. Difficult, but it's also very hard to find out whether metanormativism is true and whether specific theories such as might are true. Um, so, might might also not be action guiding on this criteria. You know, might, might requires you to um, maximise inter theoretic expectation, <coughs> even if you don't believe in might and even if no one's ever told you about might. So, it's this quite strong external standard, just as those impos imposed by. Um, first order moral theories like utilitarianism or prioritarianism, prioritarianism are. So, yeah, that's obviously not a comprehensive defence of normativism, but it shows that it's, it's worth considering. Um, and if normativism is true, then the MCC doesn't work, and rational policymakers should just act on what the correct utility function is, um, even, if they, even if they don't believe it. Um, so, yeah, so that's the conclusion. The MCC works given some empirical and philosophical premises, but it's unclear whether these premises are true. Thanks.